I mean, I was on the NIH study sections for many, many years. Uh, and I was funded, the very first year I was a, a college professor, as an assistant professor, and on study sections that first year because I had invented a technology called photo Fendi labeling that was uh, widely touted as being a, you know, a, a, a very good technique you know, in biochemistry for looking at certain enzyme structure and function, et cetera. And uh, to make a long story short, I was funded probably straight for 25, 26 years at least on the same kind of project and uh, sometimes double funded. At one time I had a, a program to uh, make these uh, compounds that were very useful in di diagnosis, et cetera, and I had one to, that was concentrating on Alzheimer's disease because our preliminary data had shown that we could detect major biochemical differences between a normal brain tissue, the enzymes that were active, and Alzheimer's disease where certain enzymes were almost 80 to 99 percent inhibited. And this gives you a key as to what's going wrong in the Alzheimer's disease brain. And I got a five-year program project grant to study that. And uh, at that time, what I knew, uh, you know, reading a lot up on, reading up on Alzheimer's disease, is that it's not genetically inherited. I mean, you can have two parents with Alzheimer's disease, have children that never get it. Dr. Mark Sperry at the University of Kentucky had found elevated mercury in the brains of Alzheimer's patients versus uh, normals, age-matched normals. And uh, so I thought looking at heavy metals would be the way to go. So I did a set of studies showing, uh, testing what heavy metals would do this. And mercury was one of them I put in. And at that time, I had no concern about amalgam fillings, anything regarding mercury toxicity. But the, the, the phenomenal data that came out was that mercury, and only mercury, would cause the same biochemical abnormalities as you saw in Alzheimer's disease using our technology for evaluating uh, you know, the activity of certain enzymes. It showed that the tubulin was totally dysfunctional. Mercury knocks that out very quickly in our, in our, in, in not only in uh, control homogenous, but if we expose uh, rats to mercury vapor, their tubulin after a period of time just dissipated like you'd see in an AD brain. Uh, and creatine kinase, uh, which is an enzyme that's 99% inhibited in the AD brain relative to age match controls. And of course, being a biochemist, I know that enzyme quite well. I was the one who uh, isolated and identified its uh, nucleotide binding site. And it had a sulfur in it, a very reactive sulfur. And other people before me had shown that that sulfur was critical to the activity of the enzyme. Of course, that sulfur is what mercury is most uh, highly attracted to. And the third one was glutamine synthetase. It's, uh, it's known uh, that glutamate levels are elevated in Alzheimer's disease brain, and this is the enzyme that removes glutamate from the synapse in a, in a brain after a neural transmission. So we had three key enzymes, and everyone thought that was great. No one's ever said I was wrong. Every matter of fact, they say I'm right. There's no doubt about the fact that the observation's right. And when I got into trouble was when I said mercury caused this. And I got my next grant back, and I had that data in there and the progress report, et cetera, and as a, something I wanted to study further. How could you reverse it? How could you address it? What was the effect of, uh, say, things like lead and aluminum, uh, you know, co-intoxicants on how much mercury would require toxicity? Because I knew that lead plus mercury is a, is not, a, toxicities are not additive, they're synergistic. I mean, one plus one will equal 10, 20, 100. And uh, when I got the uh, review back, uh, the scientist part, part of it was fine. They knew I could do the studies. They knew I had the tissues. But at the end, there was this kind of thing. Uh, Dr. Haley, and it said something to the effect, Dr. Haley has to realize we don't need to see any more of these kind of studies. And my grant, uh, uh, there were some other comments in there that were ridiculous. And so I challenged that grant. NIH has a very fair system that if you don't like and you think people uh, were incorrect in making value judgments about what you have said you're going to do, that you can challenge it. So that I challenged it. It was sent to another study section. And the other study section said, Dr. Haley's right. These, these critiques, some of them, are, are ridiculously wrong. And so I got my grant. But the next time my grant went in, it was triage. In other words, it's just, this is uh, maybe fine research, but we just don't want to do it anymore. And so uh, since that time, I've never gotten another NIH grant. And it, it coincided with uh, the report that mercury causes an Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> I had friends when I put this poster, when I, you know, they have poster sessions at the, you know, 
um, American Society for um, Molecular Biology and Biochemistry. And my friends come, I mean, it, my, my poster was just totally surrounded, three deep most of the time, because this was considered a major find. And the, the people who were my peers at that time told me, well, Boyd, I remember one of them saying, Boyd, go buy a big truck and just back it up to NIH and tell them filled up with money, because this is, this is worth a lot as far as, you know, all of us thinking this would help with the health of the country. Why hasn't the NIH stimulated? They have conferences all the time. They fund conferences all the time. Why haven't they developed a conference to really come out and look at the scientific data that's been presented, that's been done over the last 30, 40 years? They don't do it. They, they stick their heads in the sand and run because politics controls our science, not the science. We have driven, I think, the good scientists out of the FDA, the CDC, and I don't think the ADA ever had any. I've never been invited to an Alzheimer's conference to present my data, and it's very, very dramatic. I mean, it is dramatic. No one else has identified <clears throat> anything that might be possibly exposed to humans that would cause the production of the major diagnostic hallmark and three of the major biochemical abnormalities you find in Alzheimer's disease. Mercury, and only mercury, causes the breakdown and the depolymerization of tubulin off of the neural fibril, producing neurofibrillary tangles, which is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Those were the same people who did that that did the rat studies with me, you know, and where we tested the brains after they exposed their rats to mercury vapor showing that, again, they had an AD-like brain. Uh, by that time, I had realized that dental amalgams were a, a, a controversy where we're putting grams, actually, grams, and we release uh, many, many micrograms of mercury per day into our bodies, which could, you know, cause the effect. So you not only have, you know, a toxin that can do the effect, you have it placed within inches of your brain. And, uh, you, but I can tell you, the government does not want to look at that and doesn't want to admit it. And this is a major failure, not only of NIH uh, and, and other scientific groups, but of the Food and Drug Administration. I mean, they are criminally neglect because they know this. I know they know it because I have sent them affidavit after affidavit, and it's not just my research, it's anyone's research, and you won't have them ever get on a stage and debate me. So it's, um, it's, it's somewhat uh, disconcerting that you think that perhaps political uh, people have a uh, have some control over NIH, and if they like what you're producing, fine, but if it's politically uncomfortable, it's just not going to happen.